Fantastic. So very good evening to everyone who's joined us today. Uh, my name is Praveen Srinivasan with U Law Practice. We're a Canadian company, been in business for just under 13 years. And our sole purpose really is to serve the needs of legal practitioners across the country, specifically across Canada, for all of their legal accounting, practice management, business accounting, and in some provinces like Ontario, their court forms automation as well. So the top three or four uh, takeaways for you, if you don't know who we are, we are looking to um, evangelize the message of simplified accounting and the importance of legal compliance as that is something that certainly that the law societies of different provinces adhere to and request you to adhere to as well. So with us, we're hoping that it will be a seamless process for you to manage your books, to manage your business, to manage your clients, your matters, all in a very compliant and cost-effective and cloud-enabled manner. Okay? What we offer is a product to you. As you can see right here, it's a 256-bit encrypted, which means it's just bank-grade secure, cloud-based platform, which means you don't need any software to download to your local computer. You can access this on your MacBook, on your various different laptops across browsers. We're more Chrome and Safari friendly, but you are able to access this across other browsers as well. Okay, and. I do have a simple agenda that's been set out for me, but I also will use a um, presentation that I present at most of the institutions called Everything Practice Management, and do my best within the next hour or just over that, if time permits, to walk you through how we manage all of those various facets of your day-to-day -day lives using our platform. Okay? All right. So. I'll take two minutes to kind of give you an overall overarching aspect to what this presentation is about, and then I'll also jump into this quick agenda that I have provided to us by William, keeping us honest about cut the crap and let's get to the you know get to the point. Let's talk about these specific items, which I would. Sounds fair. Is this a good use of your time? Sounds good. Awesome. All right, so as legal practitioners, when you're studying right now and when you graduate and start your own business or part of a legal business, the one thing that you start to understand pretty soon is there are certain obligations that you have to fulfill as a legal practitioner in the province, right? Easier said than done, of course, uh, but there are several such obligations. And what we've tried to do is kind of encompass all of that within the top seven or eight takeaways. There are certain things that you law as a platform can accomplish or complement you in accomplishing those obligations. There are, of course, the certain aspects of other things that we request that you do your due diligence homework to ensure that you're top of your game, especially around, let's say, personal time management, uh, professional management, ethics, and things of that nature, right? But anything around client files, accounting, and the big buzzword around compliance, especially with the trust and general ledgers, journals, all the big words, we're here to help um, present that in a simpler manner as you use the platform. So if you really look at the top five or six obligations that you certainly have to be um, taking care of, starting is really with the client intake process. So you, as a legal practitioner, are also a business owner, so you need to find your own way to be able to intake a client. And typically that's where we start as a legal firm to be able to find many new ways to market your service and also intake clients from various different sources. Could be people calling you in, people who could be reaching out to your uh, front desk, they could email you with information, they could phone you, etc. right? So being aware that there's many different channels, could come from Facebook, social media, many different channels that you can get client information. What happens next is part of that initial journey. So as soon as you have that client intake, of course, you have obligations around how you service that and how you communicate the services that you offer in a very professional and precise, prudent manner. Okay. So if I were to jump into the presentation here, so really 
creating a new client. So let's say it's a client intake. What does the client intake look like? So what you see with you now, of course, is a version of the ULA platform, and I'm using, um, let me realize that. It's not a version of it. It's the same platform, but it's been customized for my fictitious legal practitioner, Roger Moore, as you can see here, one of my favorite bonds, though I do miss Daniel Craig. And I will miss him dearly after uh, the last movie. So if you haven't seen the ULA platform yet, it's really a really pretty straightforward WYSIWYG user interface. What you see is what you get, and we've tried our best, and we're continuing to put in you know, our investment in to making this simpler and easier. But if you look at our labels, most of them are, we hope, are explanatory themselves um, to, for you to understand what it's about. So we have seven menu options on the left. We have settings on the top right, help on the top right as well. Right? The top major hotspots, if you will, within our platform. And then within the screens themselves, you have two common friends. You have the action button, and you have another button called the document generation. Okay? And you would see most of the data entry um, in the three top three or four colors with the compliance almost across all screens being this yellowish orange color. So just getting yourself a little familiar with what you should expect. And on the top left, you see the simple option of adding a new contact. And the reason why we don't talk about clients, really, right away and talk about contacts is one thing you should appreciate as part of your legal firm. You're going to come across various different people, person, businesses um, that may or may not be your clients. Right? The good majority of them are going to be clients, but there are also going to be all these additional parties or additional people that you come across that could potentially be parties in a matter. Right? could be in a landlord and tenant board matter. If you're representing the landlord, straightforward, you could have an opposing tenant or a bunch of tenants as well as their own representative, right? representative of the opponent as it's called. So these are different contacts or contact information that you certainly need to manage within your contact database. So I will start with the whole process of client intake. So of course, the first obvious choice of a type of contact in new law is that of a client. And you may ask, what's the big deal between a legal representative and a client? And the big deal is, in new law, you cannot create a matter for any contact type that's not a client. It doesn't make sense, right? Or unless maybe you move them or upgrade them to a client status is when you can really create a matter. And I'll show you what that means. So here I've just said add new client. And this is a very simple client intake form, okay? Of course, we have taken this to the next level where you, we have introduced this new concept called client portal. And I don't want to confuse you here, but this is something that we'll definitely spend some time, time permitting later on, where you can actually just send a quick link to a customer, and they can pre-populate the whole client intake process for you, and that information just comes in where you're just validating the information before you send them the retainer letter. Okay, So we'll move on to that ne next level of empowering your end client to give you the information. But let's say this is kind of the old school way. You're either picking this on the phone or someone's just sent you some emails. And let's say, typically I do ask the students to give me some fancy names so that it sticks in their head. If you want to put some names on the chat window, I'll I'll love to take him, or if not, I'll just continue my way. Do you have any fancy name that you'd like me to create this client name under? Okay, we have the first name. And the last name. I'll say, sorry, Parker. Huh? Or maybe someone got to me. Someone's typing. Probably not. Nevertheless, thank you so much. Well, Macbeth. Okay, I will go with that. That's amazing that you can hear someone typing through the sound in this room. One of my Spidey skills. Oh, there you go. 
All right, and let's say this is SM as the nickname, because in certain court forms, and this is something you would recognize maybe a bit later in your legal firm journey, is that you have to fill out these wonderful documents called court forms, which are redundant data of the same piece of information that's tweaked each and every matter, right? And that's some, you'll see how ULaw empowers you to reduce it by almost one-tenth of the time you spend. But let's say the nickname is SM. Uh, there are many various different data elements that you can fill in. One of the most important ones, which is a compliant data element, is what's called a source of contact. During a legal audit or a spot audit, an auditor may just come up to you and say, all right, can you give me a source of contact report? Okay, so you should be like, I got this because I got ULaw. So here's what it is. Let's say this is a family referral. You can always add in your notes. Okay. And a physical address or a correspondence address if they have one at that particular time. And in ULaw, we allow you to add multiple addresses by clicking this little add button. So you could say one, two, three, four, Queen Street, Toronto, right? M2K3B9. And this could be the mailing address. In ULaw, only one of the addresses can be a mailing address. And that mailing address is what gets used across court forms. When you've got to fill out the name, address, we pre-populate that for you. It also gets used across invoices, which is an element we want to talk about here. It also gets pre-populated in envelopes or envelopes, depending on which side of the border you're from, and wherever correspondence is required. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and click Save. So... I made a mistake there, so I'm going to show you how you can go ahead and edit that. So I put in Mr. Sarah Parker. So it's very straightforward to edit the contact information, because as you can see, you have to use the word edit. Okay? So you come into this contacts on a Monday morning, having your Monday blues, and you're so pissed off, but you can still come to the contact. You can still search for whatever information you want, I just searched Macbeth, and there's only one Macbeth. So thank you very much for that. And there you go, there's Sarah. If I did John, and you're going to kill me for this, you could see there's, right away, you have ULaw retrieving all of the information with John, right? So this is one thing I find which is pretty cool with the whole platform. I've been um, evangelizing the platform or talking about it or demonstrating it for over... 13 years now, and the one cool thing and I find across software uh, with ULaw is that it's very fluid, it's fast, it's straightforward, and the search is pretty cool. Okay, let's go back to R. So not only can you search for information, if you go into our dashboard, which I highly encourage you to do over a certain time period, you can see this recently modified contacts and Sarah Macbeth being the, one of the more recent ones. And you can click on it and it brings you right into Sarah. So you could see Sarah, AKA SM. You could scan the QR code if you like. It gets into your phone. But that was before we had our ULaw app. But today you have your ULaw app uh, free to download from both iOS and Android. And you could have done this client intake right from your phone. Okay, just log into ULaw on your app, put in your credentials, and the same ad client, you could do that right from your phone. And you can see referred by Aunt Lisa. You've got the mailing address being Queen Street. I want to make a quick change. It's not Mr. So I'm going to click Edit. Pretty straightforward. All right. The one thing to note is that I always have to click Save if I do change information in any of the fields. Okay, Something for you to write down or keep in your mind. Uh, it's not an automatic save. We tried it. It didn't work. So we're empowering you to make the right decision when you hit save. Now, as per the Law Society's guidelines, 
right? As part of that client intake process, one of the first things that they ask you to do is a conflict check, right? I'm sure you've heard of this. You've already been taught about it, which is ensuring that you are fully aware of any conflicts that may arise in representing or taking this client any further in that journey. So what does that really mean is that you need to be able to refresh your memory of all the clients that you've dealt with, all the matters that you've dealt with those clients, or even that name. You may have come across Sarah Macbeth as a witness in a totally different matter that did even matter to her, Un completely unintended. Um, in which case, you need to be aware that when such a Sarah Macbeth does come to your doorstep to be requesting your help for representation, that you have all that information readily available. So in new law, we have what this is called as a conflict check under the action button, where all the action happens. I'm going to hit conflict check. Now you have three options. And don't want you to get overwhelmed when you see a pop-up screen or a button or anything in new law. The platform is purpose-built to keep legal or law society compliance. So if you see something on the screen, it's probably because somebody in law society has asked for it or somebody in our client base has requested for a feature that would benefit not only themselves, but um, inadvertently legal practitioners. So you can either search for Sarah Macbeth just by the name, in which case you leave this empty and you just go ahead and click conflict check. And this is the cool, fun part of cloud. As this crunches the data behind the scene, and I'm using a platform, a test platform here that has several thousand matters and clients, so we'll give it some time. I could also just check if I've come across, or I've created, rather, any matters for that person. First, let me show you just the name conflict. So you can see I've just searched for the name, and I've got some first name conflicts. I've got a Sarah Doe and a Sarah without the H2. So smart enough to understand sounds like. And with Macbeth, I have a Beth Rogers and Farah supposedly sounds or enunciates similar to Sarah. So you've got that. Well, that's good. What's important is that this particular document, as per Law Society's guidelines, be date stamped. So you could see clearly it's on the 2nd of November, 2021. Okay? So you could stop right here and you can be like, okay, after this, you, as the legal practitioner, need to make an informed decision if you want to take this any further. Right? You law or any software would never be able to tell you, and we hope that day never comes, to tell you that take this person or don't take that client. Because you also have the opportunity, even if there's a conflict, you may provide your own reasoning for why you want to represent this person. Okay? If I do matter screening, which is the second option in, it not only checks for first name, last name, now ULaw is running the entire database to look at all the matters that you may have created for someone who sounds like Sarah Doe. Or you can do some deeper dive, so you can come in here and you could say Sarah Doe. Put in the contacts. There's a Sarah Doe. There's our Sarah. Choo -choo -choo. Oh, there it is. And here's that second one. Of course, there are no matters that you've created for any of these folks. So let's go back to our Sarah. Let's say you've done your conflict check, yeah? You're now moving forward to the next aspect of what's required, which is creating a new matter. So can I, at least with a shake of or nod of your heads or just kidding, but if you can just say yeah or nay, uh, agree that you understand kind of how to create a new client? Yep. Okay. <laughs> All righty. It's, it's uh, yeah, post-COVID, I think we're all going crazy. We just have our own 
got to motivate ourselves. Nothing wrong with being your own biggest fan. <laughs> sure. I, I was definitely not fishing for it, right? Okay. And it's also part of your obligation, right? It's not something fancy that you've done a favor for yourself. Yes, you have done yourself a favor by complying with the expectation. I'm so sorry for saying that, but that's the reality of it. Now comes the next phase. You have to create the file, but it doesn't end there. You need to be very cognizant, and the hope is that you've either learned from others in the industry or you've picked up from your teachers or you've spoken to colleagues, friends, about the types of practice that you feel very confident delivering. What are the types of services that you, your personality, your education, your background can help with? Or sometimes it could be a marketing component to it. Maybe you're good at um, advocacy. Maybe you're good at paperwork. There could be many different facets of yourself. And hence, you decide, okay, I'm going to focus on land on tenant. I'm going to focus on accident benefits, or I'm going to focus on small claims, right? And the reason we talk about that is this important document called retainer letter. And often, I'm sure you've heard of it. It's nothing but an engagement letter. It's a statement of work. It's a proposal, really, between two businesses. In this case, it's between one business and, let's say, an individual. Potentially, it could be another business. You may be working for a law firm uh, on a side gig, which is still a, again, I don't want to go there yet, but it's a retainer agreement between two entities. Now, what the Law Society talks about is the importance of that retainer letter or engagement letter being very precise, very straightforward, clear, and easy for the end person to understand, read, and comprehend and reduce the amount of legal lingo, which can be sometimes confusing, okay? So if you have created that client and you want to move to the next step, you can just click on this matter button to create a new matter for this new client. Because I stressed upon a point, if I were in a different context, so let's say I went into representatives, which is a group that we allow you to create contacts under, you could see there is that blue button missing called matter because, as I mentioned before, you can only create matters for either clients or ghost clients. Now, ghost clients are those very special, in quotes, clients who come in, give you some information, flirt with the idea of engaging you, and then disappear like the ghost, right? And in those cases, you would just promote that individual you can just say group and add them to ghost clients, which really means you move them from clients to ghost clients, which means you're now waiting for them to come back to you, or you may just have to end that whole relationship, that train relationship that you had um, with a non-engagement letter. Okay, uh, But let's say we create the matter. I'm going to go ahead and click on the matter button. This now on the left-hand side, you could see we're now progressing over to the next tab or two tabs over to matters or files. And here you can see the client's name, Sarah Macbeth, and all the other clients that you have. And you can also search specific clients. So this is a Chris Johnson. So if you choose Chris Johnson, all the matters for Chris Johnson will show up. But just sharing with you, this is the client, Sarah Macbeth. And... There's just one simple piece of information we're asking for, which is mandatory, which is a title. So something for you to understand, something for the end client to understand, something that's easy to search on when you need it. So again, participation. Would you like me to use a small claims matter, land, lot, and tenant board matter, any specific areas of practice? And it's a question to the audience. You can use the chat window. POA? Okay. You don't sound too excited. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I will, well, I'll go with small claims and also add POA. To, and how's that? I don't right. want to disappoint you. 
All right, I'm going to go with small claims. Again, this particular drop-down is something you can personalize in new law. It's pretty straightforward, and I'll show you in a bit how you can do that. Uh, but let's just say with small claims. Now, you can create small claims Mississauga, small claims Toronto, small claims whatever, right? And even split it geographically like that or whatever nomenclature you want to bifurcate your clients and your areas of practices so that because you law can actually give you a revenue report saying where are you making your most money even let's say small claims is the only thing you focus on we have a few clients that only focus on a specific area of practice we help them um, kind of divide and create that pie chart around small claims across geographies or whatever right so I'm going to say this is Sarah was a Steffi, my favorite tennis player in the world, Steffi Graf. Uh, for those who were born after 1990s, too bad. Um, she's still alive, of course, but you know, she was the goddess of tennis at one point in time. And I just gave you my, my age as well, but that's okay. Um, I click Save. And one thing you should notice in New Law is anytime you're doing something, it shows up in the top middle here. We use a Google framework, um, so what you see is what you get. So what, whenever an activity is happening, where we're saving into the database and it's cloud, yes, I wish it was super fast, but that's all based on your internet speed, um, how many people are clogging your Netflix movies, right? Many factors go into it, but it's pretty, pretty solid fast. Now, I've created a matter or a file, which has a file number. Now... This is a unique number that we create because we, at, when I say we, ULaw creates because we need the unique identity for this file for various purposes, right? We need it for conflict checks. We need it for file management. We need it for cross-indexing. So the next time you go into a quick view and you want to search for, you only know it's SB or SM, and you want to search for a file with those first names, then I need to be able to give you that this is the matter here. right? Or maybe all you knew was Sarah. And the quick view is the fast and easy way for you to search for any file or matters. So you can click on it. It gives you a brief description of what it is. But if you still want to go into the matter, you can click on it. It takes you right into the matter. Okay. The quick view comes in really handy once you've started creating files and you really want to stay on top of it. Okay. Creating a new matter. Sounds good? Any questions? I think we're good. Okay. That was a trick question, though, but one of the questions we get asked all the time is, can we create our own file numbers? Now, you can associate your own file numbering system, but you have to remember what that file numbering is. Um, we, we tried it in the past where people could create that as well on the side, but it really didn't work, and it was not effective. But if you are, let's say, migrating from a different system over, which may be not be the case here, but just in case you want to create your own file numbering system, you can put that into our matter description. How did I come to it? I clicked on the edit button of this matter, okay? All right, now I've created the matter. And now it's time to determine the collateral for fees and generate a retainer agreement. Now in your law, all the documents are under document generation, right? Duh, there's no uh, points for guessing that, but document generation Again, we wanted to make it a verb or generate a document type of thing. Now, there are various different types of documents you can generate. The question is, what are all these buttons here? These are hotkeys, the most commonly used documents. And you can create them even from here. Letters, you can go in and talk about retainer letters right from here. But I prefer using document generation because I'm just so used to it. And we provide you, as the end user of this platform, a bunch of samples or good retainer documents to begin your journey with. Okay? Now, tomorrow, if you have your own template, you can bring that into ULaw as well. 
Um, you can templatize it. We can help you templatize it. There's no cost to it. Um, so let me give you an example here. And the good thing about it is you can also generate these retainer letters in both PDF as well as Word. So one of the things that you will invest in eventually is a document creation platform, which most of us uh, for donkey years have been using Microsoft Office. Or if you're a Google user, you probably use uh, the Google Docs. But let's say you have a Word Office 365 subscription. Uh, the cool thing about Word is you can edit this using your typical Word editor. Or if you have uh, PDF editors, you can edit PDF as well. Okay, whatever you prefer. Uh, so this is a bunch of samples here. Uh, also, under letters, you have hourly contingency retainer samples. There's also one specific for POA that we have, which has certain nomenclature. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and say, let me go ahead and use the first one. And the cool thing is I can also put in my retainer trust receipt. So how much of money am I expecting to get in that first retainer? So let's say this is a flat fee, and I'm getting $700. So Roger Moore is my name or the person who is using this. If there are multiple other colleagues in the firm that are using it, you can also choose who created this document. And in ULaw, any document is downloaded to your local device, but you can also upload it into the cloud. But I'll hold that for another day. So let's say this is a one-page document. I'll zoom it to 100%. Here's, um, so you can create your own letterheads, you can create your own banners, logos, all of that, um, all within the platform. So it's all under help. So you can upload your own logo and banners are letterhead. You can also upload under help your own digital signature and just upload it as a file and it's made available as well, okay? Uh, choo -choo -choo. Here's the retainer letter. And what's the f good thing about this is it reduces the amount of entry, right? It tells you that, yes, this is a retainer letter from Sarah, for Sarah was a Steffi, a file number coming from your legal office. And this is going into Sarah's mailing address. And you can edit this. Okay. And you can see it also has the retainer amount of 700 entered into this. So with minimal effort, you can pretty much generate a retainer letter. And if you use any of our third-party integrations, you can also send this as a document so that people, or your end client rather, can pay this. So we've integrated with LawPay, we've integrated with TD, um, many different credit card providers and your client, Sarah in this case, could actually go ahead and pay for the $700 using her credit card. Again, post-COVID going uh, as much as paperless as possible. Okay. So let's agree that you've signed the $700 retainer letter. You've sent this to the client. Now you have to Tell the platform, ULaw, or any system that you use. If you're using Excel, you have to enter it into your Excel um, or maybe write it down on a piece of paper, but that needs someone needs to convert that into a system so that the system can help reduce or automate the tasks. So likewise, like anything else, you tell ULaw what's happened with this file. Okay? We can't read your mind yet. We can read your bank statement, but not your mind. So... Any questions around file creation and retainer letter or creating that? Okay. Um, how are we doing for time? I, I could I, maybe I'm just doing really slowly. How much time do I have left, please? Uh, 
Um, so, I mean, it is a two hour class. I'd only booked you from six to seven, but I was only going to have them do practice exercises on you law in the second half. So if you have to run late, that's fine, though I really should give them a break around seven. Okay. Um, so I will stop yapping and maybe just run with this and you can tell me if you need to stop me somewhere. Okay. So I'm going to go All ahead right. and tell accept a retainer. So you can either go down the path of using that English label called retainer, saying new retainer. It's the same screen as you would use. Or if someone were to follow the money, you could say trust. You know that it's money being deposited into trust, and it's a new retainer type. Because there are only three different ways to deposit settlement or other payments into it. I'm going to go with the English label and say I've got a new retainer. I've got a $700 today or I can backdate this okay and let's say I've got a check check number and now I'm telling you law which particular trust account am I depositing this to of course you law is a placeholder for these bank statements or bank accounts so essentially you have a bank account in real life and you create a placeholder by putting a label against that placeholder account in new law, so that tomorrow when you're depositing it, if you have multiple trust accounts, you can tell that this was the TD Canada Trust on Mississauga Road. That is the bank and account where you're depositing it, right? Now, if anyone else paid on behalf of Sarah, if this was... Carrie or someone else paid on behalf of Sarah, you can put their name in. Or if Sarah paid for this herself, leave it empty. Click on this receipt button, and this comes to the next point of, I believe there was a retainer receipt, generating a receipt. So recording a trust deposit and generating a retainer receipt. And I believe running a matter report, I had a question. Is this, when you mean running a matter report, what did you mean by that, William? Um... I mean, I'd have to double check the assignment to be perfectly honest, because I was just making sure that you would cover all the things that they have to do in the assignment. But I think it was um, like running a report of all the time spent on the file by the members of the firm. Oh, I see. Okay. Like a timesheet. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll yeah. get to that as well. Okay. But here is recording a retainer. So I've clicked new retainer. I've entered all the pertinent information. And again, we're not asking this because we want it. We're asking this because you need it to report it in your trust ledger and journals, okay? The journals want to know the method. The ledgers want to know the amount, the date, right? And by clicking on the receipt button, you're now asking for you law to create one. So I'll click apply. With this, you've recorded the $700 retainer, received today through the check into the trust account. And here's the retainer receipt, which you can create using various different themes, Right, you can give a duplicate receipt if let's say your client needs it. You can add special notes. You can do it in English and French and you click download. And here is the retainer receipt. The first one is the original, the second one is the duplicate because we asked for it. It has your name, it's Law Society compliant. Because what the Law Society's compliance talks about is it should have your your name, legal firm name, the client's name, their address. What was the amount? What was the method? How much was the amount? And here is your digital signature on it. Okay. So trust and trust receipt. Alrighty. Now comes the fun part. You've signed the retainer agreement. You've got the trust amount in your uh, pocket. It's in your business, and you've also shared it with ULaw, which is fantastic. Now you may continue doing this for several matters. You may take your time to come back to the Sarah matter. And when you do, based on your retainer letter, based on what you've agreed in that document, you've agreed to maybe a flat rate, which is what we said. But in ULaw. This particular screen that you see is where you can dock it and enter all of the billable information. Okay? And there are several ways in which you can dock it. You can do billable time, 
maybe the entire matter's billable time. You could have a combination of billable and flat rate. You could have a flat rate completely. You could have contingency, right? So contingency is where you could tell us, okay, what is the total amount? 25,000. What is the contingency fee? And you can add that at the later time, once the work is done. Okay. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and show you. Let's say initial client meeting. So in ULAW, these are labels that are a dictionary of letters or words that we learn as you go. So if you have a certain specific standard way of typing things, we learn it if you repeat it two or three times, and then we just bring it up to you. So you could say initial meeting with Sarah to discuss neighbor dispute. And this is a editor, allows you to do your spell checks. You can bulletize it, you can make this pretty. And now, this is the time when this docket was, or technically happened maybe. The duration is the actual time you spent on it, and this is for your own internal timesheet timekeeping. The billable time is what you want to share with your client. So maybe you had 54 minutes that you spent on it, right? But you round it off to the closest hour when you bill. Now, if you're putting an hour, we take your per hour rate of $400. And where did this come? It came from our settings. So when you first create your account with ULaw, one of the first things we help you with is setting up your own personal information, including specific information around your rate. Now, you can always change it within the matter until you've generated an invoice, right? So you can always say, oh, this is a $150 rate. So now you will always take the one hour multiplied by the 150. That's why it's 169.50. Okay. And where did that come from? It came from the fact that you are a Ontario-based legal office charging HST of 13%. Again, if you are a legal office who just got started, you're not charging HST, you'd click Edit, and you'd make the default tax rate as zero, which would then take away the HST component. We'll only charge the one hour at $150. Okay, so there's several ways in which you can dock it. I can what then say add... Yes, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, um, I'm just wondering what about the rate tab? Um, is that something we can look at too? Yes. So the rate tab specifically was used or is used if you have several legal practitioners contributing to the same matter. So let's say it's yourself, your assistant, a bunch of other practitioners all working on it. Um, you could have multiple rates across multiple um, individuals collaborating on it and have their own rates on it. Thank you. So billable time is just telling us the actual time. Now you can just say 0 0.6 and it would take 36 minutes. So it rounds it up or multiplies it by the six minute interval, right? You can say 0 0.2 takes 12 minutes. 0 0.1 tab out gives you six minutes. Or you can click on it and choose the hour. Now you can also create flat rate dockets. So let's say this is a document drafting drafting of SEC form. Maybe you spend 12 minutes on it. If you click on this little toggle here, next to billable time, you could now toggle this entire docket into a flat rate docket. And instead of a time, you can put the actual rate or cost. Maybe you're only charging 100 bucks. Now, this matter has become a combination of one hour of billable time and a flat rate of $100 with no HST. 
40% of your billing so far came from document drafting, 60% came from initial claim meeting. And you can go on, so on and so forth. You could have pro bono dockets. So there's various ways and you can represent dockets. For a flat rate matter, the closest way that I've seen is people don't charge by the docket. They put in everything. So this could have happened earlier today. This could happen later today. All right, so this is gonna be second meeting. And you may not even charge for this. But you're still tracking how much of time that you spent on each. That's very important. So regardless of what you're billing, if you can find a discipline to track how much of time you've spent on it, through our timesheet we can also give you kind of a value-added report saying, you know, is it really profitable to do such work? Okay. And eventually what happens is when it's time to dock it, you can just go in and say final closure, you could say all work done, whatever, I'm just making this up. And here you can make this into a flat rate and then just charge the entire $700. So you can capture each and every docket or event, as it's called in new law, chronologically, date-wise, time-wise, don't associate rates or costs associated with it. And there's different ways. You could showcase a billable time zero and a flat rate zero is, are two different things, and I'll show you. Let's see if you've done all the docketing. Uh, in fact, let me also, for purposes of time, I'll say $600 as the docket. I'm going to show you how you can add a disbursement. Ideally, you could pay your disbursement out of trust, right? Which is something we talk about in all our webinars. So if you go into disbursements, you can say add new disbursement. And because you have money in your trust account, you could ideally, we vouch for this, you, you're better off paying this trust disbursement. So let's say I'm writing a check for a court fee paid to the ministry of finance, or who are you writing this to, right? Coming out of your trust account, the same one from Mississauga Road, because that's where you deposited the 700. You can even print that check. So William, would it be okay if I show you how you could pay your disbursement out of trust, or would you like me to show how it's paid out of general? Um, out of trust is fine, uh, as long as I know kind of where they have to go to pay a disbursement, that's all I'm really looking for. Yeah, you just click on disbursements, add new disbursements. So I'm going to give you this example. Let's say I'm paying it out of trust. One thing you'll notice right away under trust receipts, this will automatically reduce to 600. And here is my check. So you could put your own logo, letterhead, whatever. Uh, and if you print this, this would em and leave your check on your printer, it would emboss right on top of it with its own remittances at the bottom, so you don't have to write it. So by paying for disbursement out of trust, what we've done is we've taken right out of trust receipt, which would reflect in your trust ledger and journal, and trust disbursement journal, whereas the flat, the fact of the matter is there's still 600 left in. Now comes the next part, which is the status that says invoice pending. Let me reduce this to 500 and show you how you can do disbursement out of general account. Difference, of course, is if you've paid a disbursement out of trust, it's taken right out of the trust account. If you're now writing a disbursement out of general account, in which case I'm going to say add new disbursement, I'm not paying it from trust. I'm paying it, let's say, for actuals out of my general. This time I'll say this is a application fee. 
of $100 tax exempt. I'm paying this on behalf of my client, paying this to the Ministry of probably should have done it the other way around. This time we are asking which general account is this coming out of or how are you paying for it? Or are you paying it out of your own pocket? Or are you paying it out of your credit card? Most of the times it's coming out of your general account through a check or maybe an email transfer or something like that. So I've shown you two different ways of dispersing. One through trust, one through general. The difference, of course, is the one that you just dispersed out of general, you have to do your trust transfer to earn that money because that money is still sitting in trust. So now comes the final step, which is the invoice. And you'd ask me about pre-bill. Yeah, Praveen, um, is it okay with you if I give them a 10-minute break and then we come back to finish the demo? Like, do you have time to do that? Yeah, let's do it. Um, I know I may have spent okay. a little bit longer than I would have liked, but we're almost there. That's okay. All right. So take 10 minutes, everyone. We'll come back at uh, 10 after 7 and finish off the demo. Thanks, Praveen. I I'm going to hold on to this line. I'm just going to put you on mute or just stay on yep, mute here. Sure. Yep.
Okay, so I guess uh, we got two more minutes. I think we're all here now, Praveen, um, so we can probably get going in just a minute. I just have one student that's trying to join right now and it's not letting her. Is this chat still open for everyone to join? Oh, you're good now? Okay. All right, well, I think we're good, Praveen. Okay, awesome. So I had just uh, completed showing you how you could dock it, disperse, and finally we're going to be doing a pre-bill. So in ULaw, you click on the invoice button, and a few things to look around is clearly the status says invoice spending. You can click on it. If any previous invoices have been generated, you can always review them or reprint them. But I'm going to go ahead and click the invoice button and click pre-bill. Of course, I'm sure you already know, pre-bill is a preview of an invoice, how it potentially would look like. It's a great error-free way to really see what that document looks like before generating one. And I'll go ahead and hit preview. And here's that pre-bill. You can see because of the pre-bill nature, there's a watermark called preview. And I have all my dockets. And you can see the difference between a billable time zero, which was my first docket. I said billable time, and I made it zero. The difference is that in a billable time zero, we actually put the unit cost per hour. So this is one way sometimes legal firms want to really showcase to their clients saying, hey, we charge you like $1,000 an hour, but we're doing it for free, you know, because of the whole flat rate manner of this thing, right? Uh, whereas the flat rate zero, you would not show that. That's the second one. That's the main difference. And you can see it also has what was done and by whom. So here's the $500 flat rate. It's a running bill, so it also shows you the general disbursement of $100 towards the application fee. And then it shows you anything that's touched the trust account. So data in, data out, you had a retainer of money of 700 coming into the trust account, and you had a disbursement, which is another payout from trust. So leaving the trust account, leaving your trust account at 600, okay? And hence, if you take the 500 plus the $100 disbursement general, essentially what you're telling your client through this preview is that there's no more money in trust, and I'm going to be moving the amount into my general. If you like this bill, you go back, hit invoice, and instead of pre-bill, you hit the complete button. This is how you actually generate an invoice, which has an invoice number, because a preview, I don't know if you noticed, but a preview does not have an invoice number. It's for your eyes only, to make any corrections, any changes that you need. Okay? So I'll go ahead and click Invoice Complete, and there are many different themes. I can use my own default theme. I'll use the winter theme, and I can backdate this. So for anyone who's looking to backdate invoices to bring data in, you can do that. You can also mark this as paid. What that really means is that if there's money in trust and the client really doesn't have to make a payment, you can just say paid as a little stamp. And I'm going to click on the Invoice button, and I'll click on the Download now. I can see you can have your own letterhead logo for Roger Moore Law Office. This is now having an invoice number associated with it. The matter, the amount due, and here's supposed to be the winter theme, like more of a frost frozen theme. But and here's the stamp for paid of the six hundred dollars that's already taken care of through that initial retainer that you received. Okay? So you send this off because this is a PDF document. You could technically email this to your client. 
And with that, you've now generated an invoice and you've sent it off to the client. Okay? So after this is done, there's one final step for you to make your money, which is moving money from the trust account into the general account, which has still not happened. So just like how the retainer was entered into ULaw, you have to do this in real life. You would go into the bank or do this online, and you would move the money from trust to general. And this is where we recommend that if you're doing it, do keep ULaw handy, because ULaw can tell you the exact amount without any trust errors or misappropriation, the eligible amount that you can transfer. Okay? So for that, I'll come back to my ULaw. If you see this little jumping question mark, if I were to click on it, it gives you a little bit of data. And it tells you, so far you had 700 in deposit and trust, 100 was withdrawn, and leaving the balance at 600. And there was an invoice for an amount of 600. And there's a pending trust transfer of 600. And how did the 600 come about? It was 500 plus the 100. Okay, I'll do that one more time. Okay. So this is the final step of you doing your trust transfer, which I think was a question two. So you could do the question mark because that's the fastest way you can do it, or you could just say action. And this particular step is moving trust money from trust to general, so it's withdrawal from trust. It's called trust invoice payment transfer. It's the same button, but if you can get yourself familiar with this question mark, it comes in really handy. You just have to click the red buttons. So you can choose both transactions. Say it's moving from my Mississauga Road trust account into my general account. And in Ontario, if you do an electronic fund transfer, let's say you, you have your TD account right now, you're logging in, you're doing the trust transfer of 600, and then you come back, you put the receipt number or whatever number they give you, EFT number, and then you just hit transfer. The fact that you mentioned that it was electronic fund transfer, ULaw automatically understands that you're an Ontario-based legal practitioner who just did an EFT for trust money. And hence, there's this Form 9A that you can download right away. And all this information is pre-populated, and all you have to do is hit download. Of course, because this is set up for British Columbia, it's bringing that up, but I can go into my settings. Okay. If I change the jurisdiction, it would automatically change to the Ontario... Uh, forms. I want to say I think it's someone who changed my overall settings. Give me one second. I'm going to go back to matters. And I can always reprint the Form 98. So I can go into my accounts, go into compliance, monthly compliance, and reprint the Form 98 for the month of November. So even if you didn't fill it out then, you can always fill it out later. Right? And here's Sarah Macbeth's transfer of six hundred dollars from trust to general. Okay. So this is done. Okay. 
Okay, so you've got a client fee book, timesheet, accounts received report, recording payment, and downloading payment receipt. Um, so yeah, like it's very similar to the trust. So let's say we go back to And someone mentioned about a POA. So let's say I create another matter, right? I'm just going to say action, new matter. And I'll say this is a POA matter. And let's say there was no trust or nothing involved. It was just a straight do my work, get paid. I would just simply go ahead and dock it my time, generate an invoice, and accept the payment. So in that case, I'll say I could even encompass all the work done in one simple docket. So I could say POA matter. In the description, I could say initial client meeting, second meeting, cord visit, reduced um, points, Eight, fine, whatever, right? Whatever was done for that entire matter, encompass it in a single flat rate matter of let's say 500 or 565. And just like the previous matter, I could go ahead and complete an invoice. Let's skip the preview. I'll generate that invoice. I think I was just put on mute there. I apologize. Okay, I, I just thought you were being really silent there for a second. I wasn't sure what uh, was going on. Uh, it's going to take a lot of people to keep me silent, but it okay. just took a mute button. All I was trying to showcase, it, which I'll recap real quick, was I put in a 700 or in my 
80 over 60 highway matter. I put a 638.45 payment. There was no trust money involved, right? It was just a simple docket, invoice, and clicking on the question mark to accept the payment. Or it's an action, you could say money into my general account, accept client payment, it's the same button. And then I give them a receipt, which I can run here too. I could say receipt, payment receipt, and reprint that payment receipt. At all times, I can always reprint any document that I've printed before. So here's the reprint of that same 638.45. Okay? I was just trying to get that check done, recording a payment and downloading the payment receipt. Did that make sense for that? Yeah, I think we're good. Okay. All right, so the last thing was the client fee book before I run into timesheets. So if you go into the actual client and click on compliance, so ULaw has compliance embedded in various different aspects of it. It has a client compliance. It has matter or file level compliances for across all provinces in Canada. It has the most important or the most audited financial record keeping compliance. Right, so if I go into my client compliance, I have what's called as a client fee book. And I can download this fee book right here. And this is very specific to this particular client, Sarah. So you can see there are two different matters. There's 80 over 60, total invoiced, total paid, zero balance. The previous one, total invoiced, total paid, zero balance. If there are any balances, it's going to show that. You can also do an aging report, which is very similar to your accounts receivable. This is for you to know how soon this was paid. You can see there's no outstanding invoice balance. Um, but at a firm level, if you wanted to know your fee book or if you want to know your um, aging report, you can just come under compliance. And if you click on fee book, you can do this for a specific month, quarter, year, right? And if I run this fee book for my entire firm, it's going to bring the fee book across clients, across matters. Did, did that make sense, or was it too fast? I think we're good. Okay, I've either put you to sleep, or maybe this is too much information going ahead. Well, it's a lot of information. It's also a really late class, too. Okay, then uh, that's all I wanted to kind of run through here. And then if you wanted to run the timesheets, which you had, you go into Calendar, Action, and you've got your timesheets, various different timesheets right under here too, okay? Do you want to run one of those? Uh, yes, please. Okay. So I could do various different timesheets. I could do a simple timesheet for the month. If there are multiple contributors to that overall business, then that's showcased as well. So date, item, description, estimated hours, and billable hours. Okay. And we also give it to you by client information. And here's Sarah. You spent two hours, 12 minutes overall. Your billable hours was 48 minutes because a lot of it was flat rate. And because Roger Moore is the only one who provided, you've got the provider name, but if there are multiple individuals, they would show up as well. Any questions? I think we're good. Okay. okay. Accounts receivable. It's a financial document, so you would find it under accounts. And I encourage you to go into your compliance because you can pretty much download your trust ledger, general ledger, which I don't want to bore you today with. But if you wanted your accounts receivable, 
um, you would just go under aging receivables and you can download it there okay okay um, we call the invoice balance you can also download your invoice balance just outstanding for everybody but I'll shut up with that I guess there's a lot of information but hopefully the biggest driver home was creating a client creating a matter docketing, dispersing, retaining, invoicing, and trust transfer. Yeah, you covered basically everything that I, I wanted you to, so thank you very much for that. My pleasure. I'll stop the recording right here.